In the early years of Israel, airplane travel was much more difficult, and it wasn't so easy to make that trip from Israel to the United States, to Canada. One of the early leaders of the Israeli government arrived at what was then Idlewild Airport. It was a big deal. Hundreds of leaders came to greet him. He steps out of the plane, and they call out to him, tell us what the situation is like in Israel in one word. So he answers, good. Then somebody says, okay, in two words. He says, not good. <laughs> this, of course, is the perennial situation in Jewish life. There was a Zionist leader who in Jerusalem, <coughs> excuse me, every Thursday night had a standing talk. From week to week, his talks would vary, but the topic never changed, the current crisis in Jewish life. There are, of course, some serious crises going on in Jewish life. The tremendous hostility to Israel, it's the one member state in the United Nations that actually has another United Nations state that wants to annihilate it. Iran wants to drop an atom bomb on Israel. The BDS campaign, which is evil in and of itself, but which really tries to depict Israel as if it was the most evil government in the world. And the ongoing perennial problem of Jews in democratic societies fears of assimilation, concerns on Jewish continuity. But we're gathered here now also tonight to celebrate what's going on in Jewish life. And there are many, many things to celebrate. There are also many things to celebrate about we, what we as Jews and Judaism have brought to the culture of the world. The notion of ethical monotheism, the Ten Commandments, the mo most influential legal document ever created, the whole idea of the Sabbath, and we have a lot to offer the world, even those things drawn from very traditional Jewish sources. I'll offer one example. Take the notion of tzedakah. What does the word tzedakah mean? Well, people usually give two answers. They give commandment and good deed. In Hebrew, tzedakah really does mean commandment. In Yiddish, it's often used as to connote a good, a, good, a good deed. The difference between commandment and good deed, though subtle, is significant. Commandment implies something obligatory. Good deed implies something voluntary. All of us could explain why an act done voluntarily should be regarded as being on a higher ethical plane than an act done out of a sense of obligation. And yet the prevailing view in the Talmud is the opposite. Gadol ha no Greater is one who is obligated to do something and who does it than one who is not obligated. What motivated the rabbi who said that to say that it's greater to do it out of a sense of obligation? One reason, perhaps he thought, if you're doing it because you want to do it anyway, it doesn't really show you're deferring to God. But if you're doing it because God commanded it, even if you don't want to, maybe that's an inherently more religious act. But I don't think that's the real reason. I think what he was really thinking was that when we do something out of a sense of obligation, we do it with greater consistency. Let me compare for a moment two types of diets. I'm curious by a showing of hands. How many of you at some point within the last 10 years have gone on a diet? <laughs> how many of you, okay. How many of you never diet? You're the people who caused me to violate the 10th commandment against coveting. I covet you your ability to eat Ben and Jerry's without worrying about it, okay. The motives for dieting are very powerful. It's to be physically more attractive and to be healthier. Powerful incentives. So now my next question, you can put the lights on again. How many of you have ever gone for three months without breaking your diet once? <laughs> Compare that with a diet known as kashrut. There is no evidence to indicate that keeping kosher will make you physically more attractive or healthier. I have never had the experience of somebody walking into a room and I say, my God, you look fantastic. You must have lost 30 pounds. What happened? I started keeping kosher. <coughs> the kosher diet is filled with foods like challah and chulant. Believe me, nobody has ever lost weight over a Shabbat, except for the rare instance which is happening this year when Shabbat falls on the same day as Yom Kippur. And yet, because the people who keep kosher feel obligated to do so, 
they can go for years, they can go for a lifetime without eating certain foods. You know, think about it. If I'm at a bar mitzvah, a bat mitzvah, I'm about to eat a piece of chocolate cake, and somebody says, Joseph, don't eat that cake. You'll feel better, you'll look better. I'll think, when is this nudnik going to go away <laughs> so I can eat the cake? But if somebody ran over and said, Joseph, don't eat the cake, while they were preparing it, some pork fell into the mix, I'd throw it away in hara. I have a theory. If the government would mandate that they had to put pork into chocolate, I could lose 20 pounds. <laughs> so the fact that we feel commanded can actually make it easier for us to do the right thing and to do it consistently. And it's this notion of commandment, of obligation, that makes tzedakah dissimilar from charity. Charity derives from the Latin word caritas and denotes an act done out of love or affection, but not a mandatory act in the same way that tzedakah, which derives from the Hebrew word meaning tzedek, is justice. If you give tzedakah, you're doing an act of justice. You're obviously also motivated by love, but the bottom line is if you don't, you're doing something unjust. The former chief rabbi of England, Jonathan Sachs, defined it interestingly. What makes the word tzedakah so unusual? And why is it that the Jewish community wants Jews to know the word tzedakah? Because they know that when people know the word tzedakah, they will give more tzedakah than if they only know the word charity. The word tzedakah, Sachs puts it, combines into a single word two notions that are normally opposed to one another, charity and justice. Suppose, for example, I give someone 100 pounds. Either he's entitled to it or he's not. If he's entitled, then my act is a form of justice. If he is not, it's an act of charity. In English, a gesture of charity cannot be an act of justice, nor can an act of justice be described as charity. Tzedakah is an unusual term because it means both. And in addition, given the event that we're at, I want to mention the particular significance of giving to the Jewish Federation. Because when you give to Federation, unlike charities devoted to one specific cause, you're giving to dozens of different and important causes all at once. There's no other Jewish charitable giving that can do that so easily. Tzedakah also brings into play the moral imagination of the Jews. What do I mean when I say moral imagination? In the 20th century, tremendous problems were conquered in science, medicine, technology, because people used the full resources of their intellectual imagination to solve problems that had previously been thought to be insoluble. But there wasn't as much advance in moral issues. Because people don't necessarily use the full resources of their moral imagination to solve problems. The rabbis did. There's a verse in the Torah in the 15th chapter of Devarim, Deuteronomy, <clears throat> about giving to the poor sufficient for what he needs, which they understood as meaning. Don't think of the poor as one undifferentiated mass. They just need food, they need clothing, they need housing. Of course they need that. But also what that person specifically needs. And you know how I always understand it and I explain it and I talk about it with people. God forbid if you suddenly became poor, what would you particularly miss other than the obvious things? I know I would miss the ability to buy a book when I wanted it. Somebody else told me they'd miss the ability to ever be able to go to a restaurant. A woman told me she'd miss the ability to give her child piano lessons. The moral imagination forced us to always think of the poor not just as part of one big mass, poor people, but as each individual. Do you know, and this is not a widely known thing, the Talmud explains that Purim what the rabbis arranged the Jewish calendar so that Purim could never fall on Shabbat because such a central mitzvah of Purim is the giving of charity and they never wanted it to fall on Shabbat when you were not allowed to handle money. Years ago I wrote a book on Jewish humor because so much of Jewish values get conveyed through Jewish humor and I remember I came across a story I had heard a wealthy Jew in Beverly Hills, I'll give him a generic name, Goldstein. I hope there, if there are any Goldsteins here, it doesn't apply to you. Goldstein has never given a penny to the Federation. The leadership is furious. They send a delegation of four top people to meet with Goldstein. 
They enter his office. They say, listen, we've been checking into you. We know that in addition to your large house here in Beverly Hills, you have an estate in Palm Springs. You have a chalet in Switzerland. You drive a Rolls. Your wife has a Mercedes. Your business opened up 18 new stores this year. We're expecting you to give and give big. Goldstein is in phase. He says, really? And in checking into my background, did you find out about my mother, who's been sick now for three months, requires nurses 24 hours a day? You have any idea how much that costs? Did you check into my uncle, who's in a private mental sanitarium for 20 years? No insurance covers it. You have any idea how much that costs? Did you check into my two sisters, each of whom are married to men who can't hold down jobs, each of whom have kids in pri two kids in private college? Do you have any idea how much that costs? And if I don't give a penny to any of them, you think I'm going to help you? <laughs> I just want to conclude with two final thoughts. <clears throat> the most famous of all of the Psalms is the 23rd Psalm. Hashem roi lo echzar, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The last verse of that Psalm has a very odd construction. Achtova chesed yirdefuni kol yimei chayai. May goodness and kindness pursue me all the days of my life. Lirdof, to be pursued, is normally a terrible connotation in Hebrew. The Chafetz Chaim, the great Eastern European rabbinic sage, said, all of us in life are destined to be pursued. There are people who will be pursued, God forbid, by thieves, by people, governments who want to pursue them. There are people who are going to be pursued by debt collectors. There are people pursued by all sorts of things. He says, consider your life blessed if it's goodness and kindness that's pursuing you. Consider your life blessed if you're being asked to support causes. That's the pursuit that you're getting. And then there was a wonderful story I remember I heard years ago from my dear friend Rabbi Abraham Torsky about Don Isaac Abarbanel. Abarbanel was, of course, the finance minister in the Spanish government, but he was also one of the great Bible commentators of all time. During the time he was working as a finance minister, he had a, a, a fairly amiable relationship with the king, which later on greatly, of course, became terrible. But, you know, in the time of the Spanish Inquisition, but uh, for a while, he had a good relationship with the king, and then some people started poisoning the king's mind and said, you know, he's really an embezzler. Do you see how wealthy he's become? Finally, the king, hearing all these reports, were starting to bother him, so he went to Abarbanel, and he said, in two days' time, I want you to bring me an accounting listing all of your assets. Two days later, Abarbanel brings him the list. The king looks at it and says, this is a lie. You have much more than this. You don't even list the estate on which you live. And Abarbanel answered, when your majesty asked me for an accounting of my possessions, I knew it was because other people have been trying to malign me. If they succeed, I know that your majesty will confiscate everything I have. These are hardly things I possess because I can lose them all in a moment. I therefore am giving you and made a calculation of whatever money I've given to charity because those acts of charity and those acts of kindness can never be confiscated for me. What I have given away is truly the only thing I can say that I own. That's what the Federation is helping us to achieve. That's what all the good causes in Jewish life and in general life and causes of hunger are helping us to achieve. That's the thought that should always guide us. What I have given away is truly the only thing I can ever own. Thank you. <laughs>